development or your deployment system and actually is. You know, if you store it in GitHub, as long as GitHub's up, you're going to be able to get to your site and your page. That's how you push your fixes. It's really, really easy to hack that other people's code if it's not quite what you want. It's really easy to just edit it and then commit, push it back and it's done for you, which is quite nice. Um, everything is versioning. So you're versioning every single file of the core. Uh, you're versioning every trip module that you add, you're versioning all of the code. Everything is versioned together as one big lump, um, which is quite good. Um, however, I would say that there's some really bad things about it. Um, so, one of the bad things uh, is that if you actually just want to apply a patch to that third party code, um, it actually is quite hard because um, <coughs> once you've applied that patch, how do you sort of decide? how to record the fact that you've applied that code. Uh, upgrading modules is reasonably painful, but upgrading core is especially painful when you create this all in one repository. And so most of all, how do you know what you have? What, what, what's in the repository? Um, how do you know that, you know, it says the whole folder is called views, but how do you know that it's views? So the first sort of disadvantage that I said was that patching code is hard. Um, so the general approach is that you would take you would apply the patch, you've got a patch the door, you would commit that code into the central repository. Would you keep a record of it? No. So it's up to the person doing it, right? Whether they bother to keep a record of the patch. One dot code is really, really fatty. Um, um, download the new module, uh, replace the old code, do you apply patches? Um, um, delete the code and stuff, probably. Um, core upgrades, wow. Um, sort of like upgrade modules, but a lot of them. Um, do you sort of delete, try and delete all of the core and then replace the core files? Because the core may have been a core upgrade. They may have deleted the file, so you can't just copy the new file with all the new code base in, because then you won't, you won't have deleted that file. Um, so you just, do you delete core and then try and copy in the new version of core? That's that's really messy. Um, do you try and do it cleverly? Do you use git to apply the uh, old or do you um, use a, a vendor branch and merge in that branch? Uh, it's, it's nicer, but it's, it's still messy. And what about patches? If you apply patches, fixes, then you can know, record those, you can apply them. Or what if you pick up a new client from an existing site with one of these big giant repos of code that has all of the code in it? What's in that repo? Is it actually Google 720? Or have they just changed the version of to be Google 720? Um, have they upgraded some of the modules and not other modules? That's a question. What patches were applied? Did they bother to write down what patches were applied? Or did they just start hacking it? Did they it? It's secretly hacked. Well, someone changed some module somewhere and got no one. If you do have this situation and you don't have the lovely solution that I'm about to present, the module will hack it will scan your code and say from the sort of standard version. So it will tell you that you know, someone half upgraded to Drupal. We've had sites where like half of the site is running with Drupal, got 17, and the other half is running 14. I think it's a great one. Um, I'm just So for those guys who have been talking about a sort of traditional development process whereby you put all your code in one big repository, and I've been going through some uh, various disadvantages, which I've summarised as uh, not knowing what's in the site, uh, making module and core upgrades hard, uh, and um, online. So trust me, sort of panacea of. Yeah. Uh, 
So what happens when we want a newer version of Beam, when we're developing our site and we actually need to update the module? Um, because notice that, or remember, check back aside, uh, Bean is 1.0 RC6, which is the latest version, and has two patches, which actually are in the latest version. Handy. Um, so, to change that version of, of Bean, um, <coughs> here's how we do it. Uh, so I'm going to edit the, the make file that's in my installation profile, but it's, it's on the disk at the moment. Um, I'm going to edit that. I'm going to just so that it's clear. Uh, but basically, I'm just going to change the 1.0 RC6 to 1.1, and I'm just going to delete the new two patches. And I'm going to save that file. And then I'm going to run a funky little command called just remake, which is kind of a wrapper around make. Um, and just tell it to just make the Beam project. Uh, so just remake just allows you to sort of remake a uh, remake an installation profile make file. Uh, uh, and I'm just restricting it to just make the Beam project, otherwise it would make all of the all of the projects in front of that. So uh, we're just editing the version. So this is like module upgrades. This is how simple it is. When this is a security release, you just go and edit the one to the two on the one point zero one RC six to one point one. Very good. You run just remake uh, project beam. So I'm just restricting it down to beam so it doesn't take too long. But if you do that, it will just remake the entire. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Just want to talk about what's appear on the screen. If I do a git diff at this point. Um, the only things that have changed in my repository are the versions of the project that I want, not Bean itself. I, I'm not doing a diff and getting back all of Bean's changes between those versions, uh, which is really nice. It means that actually I can see that in, when I commit this, in that commit, what happened is I took Bean from 1.0 RC6 to 1.1. Also, do all of the Bean changes. Uh, uh, there's a time of questions in like, just five minutes. So I'll just get um, some other easy things that you can do um, and find a patch on the show is just specifying a file in the next file and then it applies it for you and it will tell you whether it's seen or failed. Uh, and also that then keeps a record of finding that patch uh, so you have to manifest. You can't not have a record of it. And dating Drupal core are trivial. Uh, in the stub make file you just change you know, 720 to 721. Done. Um, uh, you know, if you have a common set of modules, you sort of pass around between sites that do, say, your WYSIWYG setup. You know, you have the WYSIWYG module, and you have uh, maybe CK Editor module, and you have the Media module. You can package all of that into a sort, sort of, sort of snippet and make file, and you can just move that bit of the make file around. So when you want to add the WYSIWYG functionality to your to your next site, you just grab that bit of make file, and shove it in your in your new site, and all of a sudden you have all of the modules that you need, and you know that they work together. And uh, if you have the same patches, or if you have uh, work out a patch for one project and you need to apply it to the other one, again, it's really easy, you just copy the, the line in the draft make file. And also, it's really easy to see what you have because it's a single file and it says version. And you don't have to work out is that actually version 720 because you're always making new bundles of code, so it has to be 720 because there's no way of really switching on the so just uh, quickly to finish, uh, how does this work for deployments? It's also quite an important thing. Um, so again, we still build in the stub make file. Um, so we actually build a, you have your Drupal site running on your Drupal code base, you've got an entire new Drupal code base. Um, and then you just move the site specific directory over, and you put all the virtual posts and data settings, and all of a sudden magically it's using your new, new platform of code. And it's lovely. Um, we're using uh, a meant to change this. Legacy of this was not like, um, let's um, say, like, we're on Pantheon, um, legacy tools, um, <laughs> which don't support the sort of Josh Make workflow. Um, what, what we've done is actually we have one branch that has our sort of install profile, and we build with Jenkins, um, which can be any, any sort of tool. We're doing stuff you, we build periodically, and we do this Josh Make process, and then we just commit all of that code into another branch in our Git repository, which does suck from the point of view of having all of the code in our Git repository and it sort of negates a lot of what I've been saying, like you don't, want to really, don't really want to store code in other people's code in your repository. But it does mean that we're actually not really using that branch except for deployment, um, which is quite nice. It gives us all the advantages of Josh Make, 
means we don't, don't need to change other people's deployment system. Uh, so just to finish, some useful projects uh, and useful links. Josh Make, a useful project. Uh, it's included in Josh 5. Um, so go and get Josh if you haven't already. Uh, Josh Remake, uh, which is a really, really simple extension. Uh, Josh is the whole project slash Josh underscore remake. Uh, install profile, which is a very, very simple install profile, uh, is there. Uh, yeah, I'll put these slides on the session page or somewhere. I don't know if you edit. I'll put the slides somewhere. Uh, maybe in a link on the install profile. Um, so you have to write these down. Um, Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and are there any questions? So when you're using Josh Remake uh, and rebuilding a module, is it automatically going to run update DB and what kind of stuff as well? No, it's, it's literally just a, a bank downloading metric. Yeah. And that's all that is. Because there's Drush update, update, update DB for that sort of thing. And Drush is really nice, so if you do want to change tools like that, then just write your own Drush command. That's basically what Drush Remake does. It's just calling Drush Make with the right arguments. Okay. So it's just a convenience thing. It's like 80 lines of code. Um, so if you want that kind of Alex Remake, you know, the Would you mind talking a little bit about how you would use this within five say features to have like you know code based deployments and making sure the changes that you are actually making happen in code rather than just being a database or something? Um, uh, I'm going to dodge that question by saying that doesn't really differ from the normal way you would build Drupal sites. Okay. Just the, the custom code is stored in the installation profile rather than just in the sites. Like okay. wherever you put your custom code now, you just move it to the installation profile. Okay. And Drupal just picks it up. Alright. Sorry, there was a question on my first Yes, I think I know what you're asking is now. I, what you're thinking is if you're updating a module, wouldn't you just use Josh rather than go through Josh Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah. There's no, there's no reason why you can't just do Josh GL um, and update the module and Josh actually you now moves the old one away and puts the new one in place. I don't know if Josh can do core upgrades yet. Does um, anyone know if Josh can do core upgrades? Yeah, I think Josh. I just, I think I just don't want to store other things. It's just, it just seems wasteful. Mm -hmm. How you've got a side where you've got kind of a lot of modules that need upgrading, not that ever happen. Um, <laughs> what's, the, what's the process for kind of making sure you've got everything. How do you, how do you actually do that, you know, in, in, in reality? Well, you know, kind of, um, you've got 10 modules that would, for example, with Josh up, it just tells you straight away which modules are upgraded. Right, yeah. So you, you run that with you and then make a note of the version numbers and then up, upgrade your, just edit your make file. Uh, yeah, there's, there's more than one way you can do it. Um, so you can, you can like, other tools like Josh tell you what updates there are and you yeah. make those in the make file. Um, we have a tool that I think is in my setup for the that um, scans your make file and then goes and gets the link to the version of the report and actually says, oh, this one has a make file, you can update this one, this one, this one, this one. Oh, and that one's a security update. So it's like Josh Up, but it's interesting. Oh, yeah.